All right, we are talking today about what's it look like to follow Jesus. What difference does it make that you're a Jesus follower in contrast to those who claim no faith in Christ and the difference that he can make? Um, just with the current crisis, does being a follower of Jesus make a difference in how you consider the whole uh, turmoil that's going on around us at this very moment? What difference does Jesus make in your life regarding that? Today we're going to be looking at the second chapter of Acts. If you have a Bible or a Bible application, you'll want to open that to Acts of the Holy Spirit, chapter 2, and you'll be able to read along with us as we get into that. So um, I've been you know, hearing uh, various news channels uh, address what's going on with the coronavirus these days. And uh, guys, are you able to get that up for me? Once again. <laughs> oh, okay. Let's do interviews online. Right. <laughs> so, uh, and we don't want to make light of anything that's going on with uh, regard to concerns around the coronavirus and the con uh, contagious nature of things and the difference that that can make in people's lives and in a health concern kind of way. But uh, there can be an overreaction. There can be uh, a state of hysteria, if you will. And it begs the question, does our faith make a difference in all of that? And guys, if you don't get it, I'm going to have to go on. Um, <laughs> just wave at me, yes or no. Uh, five seconds. Four, <laughs> three, two, one. <laughs> do you want to just do it now? Or do you want to have us to pull it up when you can? Um, if you can follow me, pull it up. Don't show what I'm not going to let everybody see now. Um, so anyway, there's a whole series of shots that uh, show kind of the hyper reaction of what's going on these days that uh, we'll forego. And I will assume God just didn't want us to consider that for the moment. But uh, I even had a shot of a cat just for Becky Wilson. But uh, I'll have to show you that one-on-one -on -one offline sometime. <laughs> Uh, so when we think about um, what the book of Acts has done for us, we're in a series that we're calling Moving from Jesus the Man to Jesus the Movement. And uh, let me pull this up for myself. And in that, we uh, began last week and we were talking about that this movement from Jesus the man to Jesus the movement uh, took place after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, and then for the 50 days that Jesus made appearances to people uh, and had various interactions with people leading up to the time of ascension, which brings us to the ancient Jewish experience that was called Pentecost. So that transition from the focus on the man to the movement began, as we discussed last week in chapter 1, um, with God powerfully speaking into the lives of people. And uh, for those of you that were part of chapter 1 with us last week, you'll remember that he primarily spoke into our lives with regard to uh, identity and to purpose. And we have been for some time gridding, putting on a grid, what does that relationship look like uh, for who is God, what does God do, therefore who are we, and what is it that we do? And uh, from Acts chapter 1, verse 8, uh, it was Jesus who said, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Of course, that's a very familiar passage to a lot of believers. But uh, with respect to you shall be my witnesses, what does that mean? Well, that's a reflection of our identity. That's who he says we are. And how can he say that's who we are? Because it is birthed out of who he is and what he does. Was that a yes? We do have it now. Okay, would you put it on the slide where I'm on the grid, please? 
No, not that. No, no. <laughs> we skip that. Okay, we're doing it. So, Jason, does this ever go on at Redeemer? I've never, never had any situation. Yeah. Anyway, I had some other slides in there. So, uh, when we think about who is God, we understand he's sovereign ruler of all people, everywhere, all things. Um, what, how does that get played out? Well, as sovereign, he does whatever he wants to his purposes and to his plans. And if he's a good God, then the, that's good things. What has he done? Well, he incarnated himself. He wrote himself into our story. Uh, we got to engage him. He lived a perfect life. He died a substitutionary death in our place, which was atoning for our sins. He made it possible for us to be forgiven and to be reconciled to him. And after that mission was accomplished, he then ascended back to heaven where he makes intercession for us forevermore. He's constantly aware of what's going on in your life, all the minutia that's in your life, and he makes intercession unto the Father on your behalf, advocating for you on your behalf. This is who he is. This is what he does. How does that impact who we are? It impacts us in this way. He said, I, you are now a witness to everything I do. And when we talk about a witness, what is a witness? A witness is someone who has seen or experienced something. And so the whole point in chapter 1 and God speaking identity into us, the whole point of that is that we would know him, translated experience him. And so we hearken back to that ancient word to know, all the way back to the connotation found in Genesis when Adam knew Eve. That wasn't just a head knowledge, that was an experiential kind of knowledge and engagement. And that's what we have with God. We engage Him in real life ways. He comforts you in tr troubling times, He guides you, He provides for you. He cares for you and expresses compassion in a variety of ways. He uh, blesses you in more ways than we have the time to talk about this morning. We are witness to these things, and therefore, uh, this is what we do. We give testimony to it. We talk about how God is real and how God is really engaged with us and with this world and help people see the reality of God. So every time we take that doing to a theological level, meaning uh, I get involved in apologetic engagement and I'm going to you know, win arguments and convince people to my way, and all, that's not what we're talking about. There's a place for those kind of things, but primarily a witness is sim simply someone who is experiencing something they can tell someone else about. So that was where we were last week when he was... Uh, the scripture was showing us how uh, the Spirit of God began to speak into the lives of people. We encapsulated all of that with this one big idea, and it's the big idea for the whole series. Speak what you know. What are you experiencing? How are you engaging him? Speak what you know. And know what you speak. Understand how God is interfacing and interacting with your life. And that brings us to today. And we're in chapter 2. And not only does he speak into our lives and speak into our purpose and our identity, he empowers the mission that comes with our identity. For us to speak what we know is our mission. It's a co-mission that we do with him. He's active in this world. We join him in his activity, and we are able to verbalize along the way or demonstrate in our lifestyle that he's real and that he's really engaged. So as we move into chapter 2, uh, as I was saying a moment ago, this all takes place in the context of Pentecost. So this is 50 days after Passover. And, of course, uh, trial and the crucifixion took place during the season of Passover. So all these ancient Jewish festivals are intermingled with these Christian identity markers. And when the day of Pentecost arrived, they, talking about believers who had been told by Jesus, you wait until the Spirit comes upon you and you are my witnesses by that power. 
They're waiting. And when they all came together in one place, suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now that's wild. What's, what was that? And now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation. So it's Pentecost. It's a major festival. Jews from a variety of nations have converged on Jerusalem. And they have done so from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together. So all the big crowd and the believers began to gather at this remarkable sound going on. And they were bewildered because each one was hearing, speaking in his own language. And they were amazed and they were astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? these early followers of Jesus. Aren't they all Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? And so it kind of raises the question, what just took place? And we know it's a miracle. Is it a miracle of speaking where believers are able to tell what they know and tell what they've experienced in languages that they didn't previously know? Is that the miracle? Or was it a miracle of hearing so the, those of various nations, no matter who was speaking, they were hearing it in their own language? What's the miracle? Well, here's the miracle. Whether it's this miracle of speaking or hearing, it's the, able, the ability to get the gospel, to hear the good news of all that has transpired with Jesus' life Death, resurrection, and now ascension. That's the miracle that God would see fit to reach into a group that is marked by a multiplicity of nations and languages and birth this message slash movement. So, to go back to our grid, now we are seeing God as Holy Spirit. And what's the Holy Spirit does? Well, he empowers believers for the spread of the gospel. He empowered them on Pentecost with this miracle of speaking or hearing, certainly comprehending good news. Therefore, who am I? Well, as we said in verse one, chapter 1, verse 8, we're a witness to all that. We see God do these kinds of things, not just from a historical perspective. We see him do these kind of things today where he is moving in our midst. He's giving us a comprehension of uh, sorting through and making sense of what's going on in life and how he's involved. And we are called to give testimony to that and to call people to believe, call people to uh, salvation. So let me say it again that we've been saying it for months. Friends, if we get this backwards, if we start focusing on the doing we will get all blocked up and paralyzed and guilty and shame-ridden because we can't do what we think we're supposed to do because we're doing it all in the flesh. The focus is not and never is on doing. It is on being. Be his sons and daughters. Be adopted children and family of God. Be empowered by his spirit. Be witnesses. And out of your being, do. It makes all the difference. Now, what's the Holy Spirit going to be empowering? As we go through the text, we're going to see that he empowers us to speak our experience of the gospel. And he empowers us to do so to many cultures and people groups. He did that then. He does that now. The greater Redmond area is remarkable uh, within our country in that we have become a magnet for the nations. We have a multiplicity. We have them by the hundreds of different ethnicities and language groups that are our neighbors, that go to uh, school with us, that go to work with us, that shop in the stores with us. And so it's to many cultures and to many people groups that he empowers us. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verses 9 and 11, 
uh, in that context, it was Parthians and Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, proselytes being Gentiles who had become Jewish, Cretans and Ara Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. Now you say, you know, I, I don't understand a whole lot of the cultural differences that are going on around us right now. I don't either. I don't know what I could do that might be potentially offensive to a person of a different culture. I don't always know that either. But we live in the greatest age of information ever. And if I have neighbors that are from a certain nation or of a certain culture, if I have someone across the cubicle or, or my children sit next to in their classroom, someone from whatever culture, with a few clicks, I can begin to orient and inform my heart to ways that can meaningfully engage, to show interest in who they are, have curiosity about the things that are important and of value to them, and engage them on levels of kindness and graciousness and friendship. And because I am a witness, that's who I am. I'm not manufacturing something. I'm not trying to pass on a package or a program. I, along the way, talk about my own life and my experience with God. And a witness happens in a variety. We, we are able to talk to the entire world right here in the greater Redmond area. It is a remarkable day. So this empowerment allows us to share our experience of the gospel to many cultures, many people groups, and to differing results. Look at what happened in chapter 2. Everybody that's encountering the same thing, all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said they are filled with new wine. It's a bunch of drunk guys acting crazy. Some people are amazed and receptive. And we are amazed at how receptive they are. And others mock, make fun of. Uh, it's just so much religious superstition. It has always been that way, and it is that way today. So we should not be surprised nor fear the things that would be of a rejecting nature. And not only do we see different results in the empowerment of, of the Spirit in us, but it helps make sense of the Scriptures to us. The Spirit is at work to connect the dots with what's going on in life and how the Scriptures, thousands of years old, are relevant to everything happening to today. Notice how this played out in chapter 2. Peter is taking in all that's happening. He's being stirred. He's being empowered by the Holy Spirit. And he comes to a point where he just breaks out before everyone and he says, Hey, in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Now what's happening at this point, Peter is beginning to quote a passage from the ancient prophet Joel. He's seeing everything that transpires. The Holy Spirit is connecting some dots for him with respect to the scriptures that were hundreds of years old by that time to what was going on in this very present Pentecost time. And he quotes this passage, God declares, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He was able to bring together those jigsaw puzzle pieces. This is what the Holy Spirit does for us. We read an ancient text and it seems as fresh and as current as tomorrow with respect to our circumstances. So it makes, helps us make sense of ancient scriptures, and it has the power to pierce hearts with truth. Now, this is remarkable. I don't have the power to pierce a heart and a heart go, you know what? 
I didn't think it was true, but it is. That's true. Notice what happens in the text. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made both Lord and Christ this Jesus whom you crucified. That's pretty straight talk. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Hey, I just had this conversation yesterday. That's how current these things are. I was visiting with a friend that a lot of you know here, and we got to reminiscing about things, and uh, I had remembered the first time that he had come uh, into this Meadowbrook family. He is a scientific type background guy and an engineer, and he had pretty much relegated religion to something for religious people or superstitious people, whatever. He really didn't have anything to do with it. Even though his wife was coming here and pretty involved here, and she'd been inviting him to come with her, and he didn't really want to. It's the case in a lot of scenarios. But then his mother got sick and his mother died, and in the aftermath of his mother's passing, he said, I began to consider, is there a life after death? And if there is a life after death, then there must be a God. And if there is a God, then what kind of God is he? And what kind of involvement does he have in life before death? This is this very analytical, scientific, engineering guy thinking and processing so that on a given week, his wife says, I'm going to go to Meadowbrook this Sunday. You want to come? And on that week, his heart was already being softened. He said, yes, I'll go. And we were reminiscing about this yesterday over lunch. And uh, he said, so I ended up coming for the first time. And back in those days, we met at Redmond High School. So those you guys that are at Redmond Middle, we've been where you are for a long time before we got in here. And he walked in, and you know, he didn't know what to make of it, and he didn't know anybody. And he sits down, and you know, there's a music thing, and then there's a guy talking head thing. And he said, you know what you talked about that day? You talked about David, ancient King David, and a son of his friend Jonathan. I can't, what was that name? What was that name? And I said, Mephibosheth? He goes, hey, that was it. That was it. <laughs> you talked about David and Mephibosheth. Now, who else remembers that message? <laughs> so he goes on to tell me in detail. This is 20 years ago, friends. And he goes on to tell me in detail what I had talked about that day in an Old Testament story. And he didn't know what I'm talking about today. He says, and it just pierced my heart. Yes, it did. And that's a Holy Spirit thing. I mean, who comes awake to Jesus out of a story about David and Mephibosheth? Anybody the Holy Spirit touches and pierces the heart. So he speaks into our purpose, Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. He empowers our mission to be witnesses who tell what we experience and call people to experience it with us. And then he saves those who will believe. In chapter 2, verse 21, and it shall come to pass, this is the fulfillment of that prophecy from Joel, it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. And as a lot of you know from that story, thousands did. And it was only a matter of a few days that that 3,000 grew to 5,000, and then it just exponentially I mean, it was a good coronavirus, boom, <laughs> expansion. So notice, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, how inclusive is that? It's a gospel of great arm-stretched welcome, inclusivity, anyone. But it's also very exclusive who will call on the name of the Lord. The 
case is made here with Peter. The case is made in the Gospel of John with Jesus himself. The case is made multiple occasions with Paul. That there is one way to receive the saving grace, the reconciling work, the forgiving uh, expression of God's heart, and that's through the gospel of Jesus to anyone who will believe it. So that brings us then to you and to me, those of us who are witnesses. This is a great season. We're in the Lenten season. A lot of you know that. It's a season that begins on Ash Wednesday, which was February 26th, as I recall, and it goes up until Easter. And it's a season historically where believers have done extraordinary things, disciplines, if you will, maybe abstaining from something or especially engaging in something to prepare their heart to rightly celebrate Easter. And some of you are doing, in fact, uh, for all of our leaders, I invited you into a prayer journey where you would pray the armor of God and the Lord's Prayer every day for 40 days. Um, but for whatever practice you're engaged in, may I suggest one more, one simple additional Will you pray for one person between now and Easter for that person to have his or her heart pierced by the word of God, by the testimony of a believer, by the invitation to know and to experience Jesus? Between now and Easter, and somebody... Uh, there's a name or a face that's coming to your mind right now. Will you pray for that person consistently? I'd suggest every day, but whatever consistent looks like for you between now and Easter. Oh, Lord, would you soften that heart? Would you draw that life? Would you speak truth? Would you help connect dots and make sense out of the role that Jesus has played in history and humanity? Would you use my story what, whatever you want to do, God, to draw this person to a saving relationship. Will you do that? Will you speak what you know, what you're experiencing, how the Lord's real to you? Know what you speak. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you. By the power of your spirit, even now, you have brought a name or a face. For some of us, you've brought more than one. And it's our commitment to you right now. We're going to intercede and pray and call for your spirit to be at work in and around that person's life. We know you'll do that graciously. We know that you'll do that in specific, unique ways to our friend. And we're confident that you will do your part to draw them to faith. We also pray that you bring a, a boldness to our lives that is only marked by the Holy Spirit in us to share what we know and to know what we share. We pray this for your glory, for our joy. In Jesus' name, amen.